Hello, it's Joe Brett from Starjumps here with Liz Van Gran, our lead speech and language therapist, who's going to be talking about how to support children with anxiety. And um, we're going to be going for about 30 to 45 minutes. Liz is going to be talking about strategies and she's got some slides to share. And then we're going to do some questions answer some questions so if you've got any questions and you're watching now or join us later please comment um, below below the screen and we will look for your qu questions and answer them at the end um, and so because we've got a lot to get through I'm going to hand straight over to Liz <laughs> and um, I will see you at the end because I'm going to go and look for your questions okay so thank you very much Liz Oh, thank see you, Joe. See you a bit later. <laughs> Indeed, yes. So, as Joe said, we're going to be today thinking about um, communication strategies with children when they are anxious. Um, so, obviously, we're going to be talking about such a wide range of different communication difficulties. Um, so it's going to be quite difficult to cover everything, but hopefully you'll be able to pick up some tips and apply them to your own child. And a lot of it is trial and error to try and see, you know, what suits your child and, and what works. And again, as we've heard, some strategies will work for a while and then maybe we just need to refresh them and try some other things. Um, so, as I said, I'm going to try and provide a real range of things that we can try. So. What we also need to remember is that anxiety is a perfectly normal emotion and a normal reaction. Um, if we try to stop a child becoming anxious, it can also lead to other difficulties and other problems later on. So what we want to do is acknowledge that they are anxious, but ensure that the, the size of their reaction is equivalent to the size of their worry. Um, make sure that their reaction is grounded. Um, when it comes down to it, worry is a really important emotion. It's um, it's what keeps us safe. Uh, if we didn't worry about you know cars coming fast down the road, we wouldn't bother looking before we cross the road. So, when it comes down to it, worry is a, a safety mechanism for ourselves. So it is really important for our children to have time to talk about their worries when they feel safe and secure. So obviously, first of all, we need to know um, when your child is anxious and how do they communicate their anxiety. And listening to um, everybody's comments in the talks we've had previously, uh, you guys seem really clued up as to when your children are anxious. If you think back over some of the things that you, you have already mentioned um, and you've highlighted to us, we've, um, you've spoken about um, yeah, classic anxiety reactions. Um, we've also had um, children who have regressed with their toileting. Uh, they may have become more controlling with their food intake. They may refuse to leave the house. Um, we might also get physical reactions as well. Um, my little boy often just says, oh, my tummy really hurts. And, you know, when he's telling me that and there's no other reason, then I know actually he's probably quite anxious about something and um, he's finding it difficult to recognize the fact that it is anxiety. Um, as, as well, both my children are having lots and lots of nightmares at the moment, and, and that's a real sign of anxiety, their brain trying to process the things that they are um, seeing and hearing during the day. So obviously it's really important to recognize these anxiety signs, and, and you know, however, however good we get at recognizing these anxiety signs, sometimes, they just seem to sneak up on us and, and we don't quite know kind of what's hit them and then for what's hit us. So sometimes when we reflect back on a situation, it's useful to use an ABC chart. Um, so you might have seen these before where you look at the antecedents, the behavior and the consequence. At the moment, when we're just looking at anxiety, we don't necessarily need to look right away at the consequence. But if we look at their behavior and see what preceded it to see if we can find any triggers, that have um, caused them to become anxious or worried. And then we can see if we can um, change their reactions to it or, or try and explain things to them. So I'm gonna try and look at communicating with them in two separate 
occasions. So we're going to look really quickly at their anxiety um, at that moment in time. And then we'll spend a little bit more time looking at um, trying to give them strategies and support them um, with their anxiety away from that period of time when they are anxious. So in quite a few of the talks you've heard already, um, the uh, fight, flight and freeze um, reaction when children are anx anxious. And I know Anya and, and Dr. Liz both mentioned it. And they talked about the primitive brain taking over with children. So um, I, I listened to a training talk a few days ago and it spoke about your upstairs brain and your downstairs brain. And at that moment in time, when a child is highly anxious or in a highly emotional state, it's their downstairs brain, their more primitive brain that takes over. Um, and, and quite a lot of that is our, um, that's involved with that is our limbic system in our brain is sending all these hormones rushing around the body and the body is trying to process them. And while that's happening, um, it can be really hard for children, the upstairs brain, to um, to be working, blood is pumping um, to parts of the body that are going to um, save us if we're if we're in a scary situation with our primitive brain. It, it's you know our blood could be pumped to our legs so we can run faster if we're going to flee from the situation, or you know we're going to be fighting for for our lives and our lungs are, are getting more um, more blood being pumped to them which means at that point in time, less blood and less energy is going to our cortex, the upstairs brain, which is where our language centers are. So um, language processing centers in our brain are in our frontal lobe and in our temporal lobe and also in our parietal lobe. And it's all part of your cortex. And at that point in time, when we see our children becoming access, anxious, their cortex isn't, um, isn't working as, as fully as it, it could be because all our energy is being put into trying to save our lives. So um, our children's understanding of language is therefore going to go down and also their ability to express themselves is also going to go down, which is where we see a lot of the extreme reactions and the extreme emotions. So obviously, following this thread, if our children are in a highly emotional state, um, they're less likely to be able to understand what we're saying to them, and they're less likely to express what they're... Hello, cat, you're coming to join in. Um, they're less likely to be able to express themselves. So this is just not verbally expressing ourselves themselves. It's also being able to express them with whatever form of communication that they're using at that time. So I do, I'm gonna try technology. So fingers crossed it works. I just want to show a quick slide that I found um, when I was just looking up things for this presentation. And it's by the two ladies, Carrie Dunburen and Mitzi Curtis, who developed the um, uh, incredible five point scale. So this is called the anxiety curve. So, I am going to give this a go. Oh, I don't think that's worked. So, not sure that was working there. So, um, well, I'll try and explain it to you if it wasn't working. So there's this uh, a curve that you can see, and they have the um, points. So at the bottom of the curve on either side, you've got um, one, and then as you go up, there's two, three, four, and five at the very top. And there's a green box down the bottom, and that green box is where we're going to be teaching children um, how to regulate their emotions, how to express their emotions and their anxieties. At the very top of the curve is number five. And that's where they are so in the midst of their anxiety, they're completely unable to, to communicate or um, 
make decisions and it's at that point that we are needing to um, support our children to um, to regulate their emotions and their anxieties. Um, two um, is where we start seeing the children's um, the children becoming anxious, and that's where we can get in and do some work with them. But it's already beginning to be a little bit too late. And three and four are when we're trying to calm them down. Um, so when we're calming them down, we, we need to keep ourselves as calm as possible. So I am going to just try this screen share again. Um, Hi, Liz. Um, Hi, before when we were trying it, it just yeah. took a moment to come up. So if you want to keep trying, then I'll add it into the screen when it comes, because it did work before. It worked for us, didn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Technology. It's always the situation, isn't it? Okay. I don't know if I click this, if it makes any difference, because I did do that before. Okay, so So are you able to share that screen? It was there and now it's jumped away again. So could you just try again? Sorry, everyone. <laughs> Technology is amazing, right isn't it? It is. Okay. Oh, oh, it's coming through again. At the moment, the screen share is us so I don't know if you want to get it to your desktop there we go okay so oh, keep I'm it. going to and then I'm going to take me out and I'm going to put this in with you hopefully oops um <laughs> Okay, so I will carry on talking because when Jo disappears, her voice disappears as well. And um, so we can see now um, the different boxes. So where I was talking about on level five, this is where people are really, really anxious and are struggling to um, to talk to them about. We can. We struggle to talk to them about it. And um, so, hang on a minute. Right, hopefully that's working now. And so, as you can see, that we've got, we've got the curve there, and we were working at the bottom of the curve. This is where we're teaching our children all about anxiety. Um, at one, the the very small curve at the bottom is where we need to keep our anxiety. But when the child is at the top, at number five, this is where it picks up the intellectual anxiety. And um, this isn't the time that we can talk to them. Nothing's going to be going in. This is where we're going to be seeing the extreme lessons. At three and four, this is where we need to be calming, using the questions to calm them down. Um, so, what can we do to help our children when they are really anxious? Um, and 
when I'm a socialist therapist, but when I call a patient by the United States, they become very, very circulated. When I get circulated, I'm not going to be able to get this job. This is when we are able to communicate. As it says on this slide, it's much harder for them to listen, it's much harder for them to comprehend, and they struggle to cope in this situation. Sorry to butt in this, but the sound went a bit distorted then just as you were talking okay. with the slide at the same time for some reason. I'm not sure why that happened. Okay. But maybe maybe what we need to do is show the slide and then you talk and then show yeah. the next one if we can do that. Absolutely. So, so people can see the slide at the moment. Um can't at the moment, they can see us. So right. I'll take me out and can you see where you choose for it to just be the slide? And then you can remove yourself at the bottom. Okay. If you hover over your face at the bottom, it says remove. Remove from stream. Yeah. You've I think you've just removed the slide. Yeah. You need to, yeah. Okay. And hopefully everyone will be able to hear us. I mean hear Liz. So <laughs> <laughs> let's give it a go. All right screen is I'm not sure that's working no I'm not sure how that's going to work at all actually Joe <laughs> well we've got a couple of options either you could carry on the talk and just talk us through the slides yeah or yeah maybe you could do it on a zoom and record it another time I'm happy, happy to carry on that's fine okay. and we can you know, yes. put the slides up later as well yes no that's fine so um we've got some great questions coming in as well so i will um disappear and let you 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 continue <laughs> yeah no worries at all um, so the slide that you may or may not have seen um, was speaking about the child being um, when they're being dysregulated. So what we need to do when they are dysregulated is try to regulate them, obviously. And Anya spoke a lot about that. Um, so we need to regulate them. Um, this might be using the sensory strategies that their OT has put in place. Maybe it's a big cuddle. Maybe they need space. Um, but the main thing is making sure that your child feels safe and loved and that there's no judgment about their emotional reactions. If they feel they're being judged, they're gonna be much less likely to, to want to talk about it at a later date and try and work it out with you. So you could have a big list of strategies um, that, they, that they need to, that they can use. Um, one thing that you know, we can do is, um, physical strategies as well to help regulate them um, and by that I don't mean necessarily the the sensory strategies that their OT would have been would have given them but um, rubbing their ears or, or asking them to rub their ears can really help because that uses acupressure points um, if you use tapping on the face that can that also uses acupressure points so that can help so those are the physical things that they could be doing going for a walk will also help um, Grounding strategies such as tell me five things you can see, four things, three things, those those kind of strategies. There's a website that I'm going to put up at the end um, that has got a huge long list of um, of strategies that you can use. In, and it can be trial and error to see whether um, they work with your children. And they'll work sometimes and they won't. And, you know, we've just got to work through them. So, so the website is called Coping Skills for Kids. As I said, I'll, I'll put them all up afterwards for you. Um, you also need to be able to relate to the, to your child. If your child knows that you're relating to them, again, they're going to be much more likely to be able to, uh, willing to talk to you afterwards. So your tone of voice. So you're going to want to talk to them. It's not obviously all going to go in, but if you're using a calming tone of voice, that's going to give them a lot of information um, and, and support, and they're going to feel accepted and, and loved. Um, you want to validate their feelings. Oh, I, I can see that you're really upset. I can see you're anxious. Um, I understand that this is difficult for you. So again, it might not all go in, but you're there and you're you're present with them. So then, only after that, the child is regulated, are you then able to reason with them? 
And on that curve that you saw, that is where we're back at number one, those number one boxes, your child is calm. And that's when you can um, talk to them and reason to them and maybe try and teach them some strategies of what they can do. Um, when they're calm, they're going to be much more able to recognize what was going on. They'll be able to understand what you're saying to them as well. So the things that, what, what are we going to talk about now? I'm going to whiz through loads of different kinds of strategies that you can try. I'm sure some of you will have tried them before. Maybe they just need to be tweaked sometimes. Sometimes you may need to revisit strategies as well. But all of them are going to be using some kind of visual element. All of them can be made more complex if your child has, has got more language skills and all of them can be really reduced down to very, very simple pictures and maybe one or two word, keyword understanding if that's the level that your child is at. So all of the strategies that we're going to use can, can be varied to whatever language level your child is at. So the first thing um, that I'm going to just briefly touch on is um, just mentioning the zones of regulation that Anya spoke about as well. That's really visual. That's lovely to be able to teach them strategies and, and use it as part of your toolkit as for psychoeducation. Um, the, the zones of regulation website has got quite a few free handouts on there as well that you can, you can have a look at um, on their website. And I can put that up at the end as well if you want. So the zones of regulation um, bring in a lot of emotion words. So I, I would always recommend um, starting off with the zones of regulation with your OT because a lot of it is very, very sensory based. But then you can bring in the language as well once the child has got uh, some understanding and, and start bringing in the emotion words so they're able to use it. Um, if you, what, what I did beforehand and, and I will show the slides as well at the end, hopefully, is I just literally Googled zones of regulation and the range of different pictures that came up was massive. So you can get really complex versions of the zones of regulation where it's all writing. And then you can get really simple versions of the zones of regulations where maybe you've got emoji faces or just simple, maybe line symbols like from board maker or from widget. Um, so you can play around with it as much as you want. Maybe you only have two pictures two of two faces, or maybe you have a grid of maybe nine faces, depending on the level that your child is at. So I, I saw a lovely one as well that used the characters from Inside Out. So if maybe you watch the film with your child, you can relate it to, to the film as well. <coughs> and then they've got something that they can lock on to as well. They've seen something. Um, and it's outside of themselves, so it could help them to reflect upon it as well. Um, so when you're using the zones of regulation, you're using it as a teaching tool. Um, when the child, when your child has, has got a, a level of understanding of it, um, then it might be that if you have a very simplified version of it, when they are feeling anxious, or in an emotional state, you could show them a simple picture and they could point to where they are on it. Um, but that that's going to be after you've been able to do um, some teaching strategies with them. Another one that we can use is, again, very similar, um, but we, we call it an emotions thermometer. So um, I've pulled up some pictures of different emotion thermometers, so I'll share them at the end with you as well. Um, there's, a, there's a lovely simple one just on Twinkle as well. Um, and again, it's just a picture of a thermometer and it starts off blue and it goes off, um, goes up. I can't remember if it starts with blue or green, green and then blue and then it works its way up to red uh, and showing the range of emotions. So you could have lots of information on there about the different emotions. Um, what I like about it, it, it kind of merges into the incredible five point scale as well, the emotions thermometer. Um, you can add in different information that your child can deal with. So it could just be the colors. We could add in faces as well to show the different facial expressions of the different emotions. We could then add in as well, um, maybe what their behavior is like. So when I'm feeling calm, this is what I look like. I'm smiling, I'm joking or maybe at the red at the top, it's like, okay, I'm really angry, I'm shouting, I'm hitting, I'm throwing things. Um, 
and then maybe when you've been able to work your way through those um stra those that understanding for your child you could maybe add in another column that goes and these are the strategies that i need to help me when i'm feeling like this so i'll show you several different versions of those again they can be completely adapted to your child's level of need you can get blank ones as well so just like the zones of regulation you can get a blank one um, where you know once your child has gone through that educational stage of teaching about the emotions once they're in an emotional state you could show them the um the thermometer and ask them to point where they think they are at that thermometer if they can't tell you where they are um, as i've already mentioned to you the incredible five point scale is a similar version to the emotions thermometer and again that was done by um carrie dunn buren and mitzi curtis someone wants to get the names modeled up there um, and again, really adaptable um, and, and it links in nicely with the zones of regulation as well. And um, you can use it to suit your, child, your child however they need it, really. I think that's the thing. One of the key things is throughout all of this is be flexible. Um, as I keep saying, you know, one time it will work with your child, one time it won't. So we, we have to keep tweaking things and go, OK, that worked last time. Let's try it again. OK, now we maybe need to tweak it. Sometimes you have to go right back to the start again. Um, <coughs> one of the other things that we talk about quite a lot is using social stories. And again, this is can be a teaching strategy of teaching what is expected behavior in different situations. We can also use social stories to um, explain what's gonna happen in the situation to try and alleviate that anxiety right from the beginning to so go okay this is a new situation but this is exactly what's going to happen so this is what you can expect as a lot of our children are very anxious when they don't know what to expect um you can have social stories that say when i'm anxious this is how i often react and these are the strategies that help me this is what i will try and think of so the lady that set up the social stories originally was a lady called carol gray and she used a very very prescriptive method for social stories which we don't usually stick to anymore um, because they ca that can be quite complex um, so we're just going to keep it as simple as possible it could just be writing if your child um, can read and they don't need the pictures or it can be mainly pictures with just a few key words depending on the level that your child is at but all of them are trying to explain first of all validate your child and explain what's happening with them um, just to try and alleviate that anxiety for them. <coughs> so at the end, I will show you a range of, of different social stories. Obviously, you've probably seen on Facebook going round and different websites, there's a whole range of social stories at the moment related to COVID-19. Um, the National Autistic Society has got one, um, which is really good. Um, and, and there's quite a few more. I think even the government's produced one. Axel Schaefer has done one as well. So, you know, they could just be stories, but in effect, they are social stories as well, um, trying to explain to children what's going on. Um, the next thing I'm just going to briefly touch on is using symbols. So, again, this could just be pictures taken off Google. That's what I use a lot. I try, I just grab loads and loads of emoji faces off Google most of the time. But there are some specific um, symbol systems that you can use and some different charts. So the main symbol systems that that, um, that we would use are Boardmaker, and that's an American company. Um, they have different ranges of um, sign up or membership, and there is a free one as well. So I don't think you can, on the free one, I don't think you can create your own materials, but you have access to a huge range of materials that are already created. So there might be something in there already that suits your child so you can go and have a look through um i th i can't remember off the top of my head but possibly for around 20 dollars a month you can have like a personal membership where you can create ones for your child um i can't remember the, the exact prices off the top of my head widget is a, a british company and um again they've got different levels of membership that you can use you can also buy materials off their website as well um, that even though they're symbol based, you can just print them off as a PDF 
Um, so again, there might be something there that um, suits your child. And they've got a whole range from maybe there's some free things to things that cost 20, 30 pounds or even 50 pounds if they're a whole big pack. But some of them are, are, are really affordable as well. So it's worth having a look at them. Clicker 8 is also great. That's got some lovely symbols in there um, that you do have to purchase. Although at the moment they do have um, free use during this COVID-19 period of time. So that's going to be worth checking out. You can create resources on there for them. It's not a massive subscription after this if you want to, to pay for it. Again, there's a couple of different versions of it. You, you've got um, just a writing package and then you've got the package with um, the symbols as well that supports, support the written word. You can buy um, symbol packs off Amazon. I saw a lovely one on Amazon actually because you could take the pictures off so you could maybe just have two pictures on it and that's got some lovely symbols. So again, I'll show that to you afterwards. Um, <coughs> Another one that we I know we've spoken about as well before, another thing that we can have a look at is using different apps to try and teach our children about anxiety. And there are so many apps out there that either help them when they're right in the moment of them being anxious or that can do some education with them about anxiety and different strategies that they can use. So a couple of the top of my head are um, Headspace, um, Calm. There's also Calm Harm if you're child is maybe starting to uh, try to self-harm as well due to their anxiety. Um, another one that I started using quite recently for my daughter is something called Wobot, W-O-E-B-O-T, and that helps them as well. So I haven't delved a lot into that one. That's quite new to me still, but it's out there. Um, and again, it's trial and error um, to see what suits your child. And um, but one of the things is that with a lot of these, you know, there is a, a monthly subscription for some of them. Some of them are completely free as well. Um, if I'm doing, if I'm just wanting to calm my children down, I use a free app called Insight Timer. And that's amazing. I, I use it for myself, you know, if I'm trying to get some meditation to go off to sleep. But they've got a whole section on um, for kids as well. And they've got bedtime stories and and. Um, bedtime meditations for them as well as calming meditations and teaching them how to breathe um, to help calm themselves down so there's a huge I, I just love that app there's such a huge range of things on there that they can use um, another quick thing is um, mo most of you will probably be familiar with Jamie who does cosmic kids um, yoga on YouTube she also does a range of videos called peace out and that's kind of more guided visualizations and meditations for children as well that can help calm them. Um, whizzing on to books. Books are brilliant for teaching them, teaching children about different emotions and anxiety, showing them that they're fine, that they're okay to have these emotions, but also teaching them how their body feels when they've got these emotions and also strategies to help them. Um, so one I'm using in some of my sessions at the moment is called Slumberkins, The Feels. Um, Slumberkins is a very commercial venture, but it's got some lovely things in it. I'm actually using the animated version, which is on Vux at the moment. So that's an American website where it's got loads of free books, animated books. So they've just taken normal books and animated them for you. And yeah, it's free if you're an educator at the moment, but we're all educators at the moment as our children are at home. So that was my way of thinking. So I've got this lovely Slumberkins books and it going, it's going through different emotions and it says how the body feels and it gives them strategies as to um, what they could do to um, help themselves. Um, another book that I've seen as well, I will list all of these afterwards so don't you don't have to try and remember them, um, is... So I'm just trying to read it um, all about worry. Um, and again, that's a workbook that they can work through. My daughter uses a book called No Worries. Um, and that's a very creative book. And she loves being creative. So she's drawing little pictures and everything working through this book. That's a series of four books. So the other books are Be Brave, Say Strong and Hello Happy, I think. So there's four of them there and they're not they're not expensive. They're on Amazon 
um, and they are, are great if children just kind of want to get on with it themselves. And my daughter will do it herself and then she'll come and show me some things. But you know, she's 11, um, so she's preferring to do things on her own. Um, an author called Margot Sunderland has got a lovely range of books um, with really strange names. And I can't off the top of my head remember them now. I'd had them all on a slide for you. So I will show them to you afterwards. Um, but I think she's a psychologist. So she's written these books, again, validating children's emotions um, and looking at them and um, it, all about how these emotions are okay, but these are the strategies to deal with them as well. And it looks at anxiety and anger and feeling that you're rubbish and not worth it and those kind of things. <coughs> Carrie Dunburen has also written a book that goes along with um, her incredible five-point scale. Um, and there's another book that she wrote called When My Worries Get Too Big. So loads of things out there. Um, I'm sure that quite a few of you will have tried things. So if you've got any recommendations as well that you could give to other parents, that would be fantastic. It certainly isn't me just standing up here going, this is what you should do. I think a lot of it, you know, people want to see things that have worked. And I've told you some of the things that have worked for my children, but there may be other things that have worked for other people's children. So if you've got any ideas, please share them with, with everybody who's following here as well. Um, Quite a few of you will have seen things like the, the worry jar or the worry monster. You know, you can write down your worries or draw a picture of your worries and put it in a jar or put it in the monster and that's where they stay. Um, sometimes you can write down your worries and rip them up to show they're finished with and, and you know you've worked through them and they're, they're done. An older child might want something like a worry journal as well. I know that um, Lou and Joe have, have put together a toolbox and, and I know that they've mentioned quite a few of these things in their toolbox as well. So there'll be some more information there. Um, so that was a massive whiz through everything. Um, I've got some, as I said, I've got some websites. Um, one of the websites is um, CAMS Resources. They've got lovely lists of different websites, different books, different um, apps, lots of things there that they've got um, that you can try out with your children to teach them about anxiety and do and, and to support them when they are feeling anxious at that moment in time. Coping Skills for Kids is another website that I mentioned, youngminds.org.uk as well. And another website that I just found um, is called, I need to read this for you, gozen.com. And one of their blog posts is 37 Techniques to Calm an Anxious Child. So I thought that was fab. I read through it. And I was like, I think I want to try all of these out as well. So I guess my main takeaway point is when your child is being anxious, you cannot teach them strategies and you cannot expect them to follow through strategies on their own at this moment in time. When they are calm, that's when you teach them the strategies. That's when you talk to them about it. Um, and then as they are getting anxious, try to recognize where they are and then start trying to put those strategies in place for them. You're gonna to have to scaffold it for them. And verbal communication it can be out of the window at that point. So you're wanting your body language and how you are with them to communicate to them at that point in time. When you are doing your teaching of them, use a lot of visuals for them because they're going to find it stressful because they know that this is something that they find hard. Um, so I did get shouted at this morning by one, one young man that I work with. But as I said to his mum afterwards, that's great. We've never had that emotion before from him, which means he's starting to realise this is something he needs to work on and it's stressing him out. And But now we know we can support him um, because we're, we're getting that level of realisation there now. So that's kind of me really, really briefly. <laughs> There was a oh, lot of information there. I'm so sorry for just like throwing it at you. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. And we've had lots of great questions and and other recommendations from... Oh, fantastic. Yeah, because there's absolutely no way I can cover everything. So I just wanted to give people a few ideas. <laughs> That's great. So can I um, put some of the questions to you? So somebody has asked... Um, when their son is three on the anxious scale, how can um, they help calm 
them down without giving in to demands, especially if you're stuck indoors. Mm. Gosh, I think I want a magic wand for that as well. Um, I, I don't know how many times I've just given in at the moment and gone, just go on the screen. I don't care <laughs> at the moment. Mm. There is a very fine balance of your own mental well-being and looking after your child, obviously. Um, when uh, on that anxiety curve, you know, if, if you've, you've got to try and be monitoring your own anxiety levels and they've got to be right down because emotions are contagious. If, you, if your anxiety rises, so will your child's anxiety. So you've got to, as much as you can, keep your anxiety down. Um, and then be showing them how calm you are and hopefully that will feed into them helping to to come down from that anxiety um, if they're going to allow you to do some sensory strategies with them maybe some deep pressure things some hugs um, some time out but not the the naughty time out um, time in time in a like, lovely quiet yeah, absolutely. Like the other week when we were talking about um, making a nest, that was lovely. And I've seen that on quite a few lists of things that people have suggested, you know, have they got a safe zone that they can go to? And maybe there are a few special things in there that they can have without you then having to give in to the demands. Um, at three, you, you can't, it's, you can't reason with them. Uh, and it is a really difficult stage. I think you've just got to try and be consistent all the time because actually consistency is communication as well. Um, and so, you know, if you're not consistent with them, that's your communication is saying, well, sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. And, and therefore you're almost then creating a bit more anxiety because then they don't know if this is a situation they can do something or they situation that they can't do something. So consistency and, um, Try also, to your ABC that you were talking about at the very start yeah. is really important because if you keep a bit of a diary yourself of mm. you know maybe when the resistance really flares up strongly yeah um, if it's not happening too often for that for you to be writing it down all the time but yeah. then you may be able to start to see a pattern of some some things that might happen before that you could perhaps change and some things that help so you can start to change some of the patterns. Yeah. Um, is it the time of day or is it just before a certain activity? Or um, mm -hmm. I, I know by now that my kids are really struggling with, with schooling at home. Um, so actually I'm going to change our, our system a little bit and make sure they do lots of activities before we go into schoolwork. So yes trying to trying to build in things into your day so you're not putting too much more any more pressure on yourself um yeah. but these extra strategies can can be built in within your normal routines and if um if you watch the talk that anya did with me on sensory processing differences if your child does have any um difficulties with sensory processing and feels sensitive um to different sensory um, input, they may really be helped. And, and in fact, most children are helped by having sort of regular little bursts of certain activities that can help calm down the nervous system so yeah. that the buildup of, of tension and stress for the child is lessened throughout the day. So um, that is a good... Um, mm, absolutely. I think when they're so young as well, um, it, it's hard to do that kind of education uh, and explaining things to them. So the physical, the sensory is, is usually the way to go when they're so little. But lovely mm -hmm. stories that, that can slowly and very gently slide in these ideas and this language is always a good, good way to start that process. And if they've started drawing and um, maybe mm. only just at three, but Pete Nord, our play therapist, did a practical demonstration earlier today of drawing with the child and helping them to think how they're feeling and just by drawing feelings it can sometimes be really helpful to sort mm. of get them to be aware of how they're feeling in their body and then how they can change that even if it's mm. simple absolutely breathing 
So another question we have um, is about a five-year-old who has had very high levels of intervention from a young age, particularly with speech and language therapy. And before the lockdown, um, he'd made really great progress with his speech and spo social interactions. Mm. But recently, there's been a big change and quite re a regression. And he avoids speaking even to family on the telephone, doesn't want to join in with nursery or friend Zoom calls. And um, yeah, so that's causing difficulty. And I think we're hearing that a lot with mm. children that yeah. things are slipping back and they are regressing a bit and, and life is getting difficult, Absolutely. understandably, because it is for us all. Yeah, and at five, it's still really hard to understand what's happening and, and for there to be a logical reason. So their comprehension of the situation is going to be right down. They're not going to understand why they can see their friends. So there might be a bit of a backlash going, no, I actually want to see my friends face to face. I don't want to see them on a screen. Um, and so that might just be their way of trying to communicate how unhappy they are with that. Um, some children can't really, really struggle to see themselves on screens. Um, I know yep. certainly when myself and Georgie have been doing assessments, there have been some children, you know, that have had to cover up their face on Zoom um, because they they are really scared of seeing themselves on the screen. Or even um, Georgie had one little boy where he had to cover up her face on Zoom because he couldn't, he found that interaction really hard. So I, I think we've got to give our children some grace at the moment. Um, and if they're really uncomfortable, not push things um, because we're not, you know, we, we don't know exactly what's going on in their brains. And when they're so small, it's really hard for them to tell us. Um, I think maybe you, we could you could do some very like easy practicing. Maybe you could he could be in your, your child could be in one room and you be in another, with um, and he has one parent and the other parents in the other room, and you could almost try and, and video chat uh, when he knows that you're just in the next room, just to try and increase his comfortable his level of comfort with that, um, and, and just try it really slowly with him. And to show him that it's not really scary as well, because he might he might be a bit scared by it if we don't know. Thank you. That's helpful. Um, so I'm just scrolling through to see because I know I've got some other questions here. Um, I was trying to type in as you were talking. There's some of mm -hmm. the websites so I'm scrolling through some of that to get to the yeah well I'm perfectly happy in the comments afterwards I'm I'm really happy to to type some things up that's not a problem somebody's mentioned a brilliant book called you've got dragons by Catherine Caves oh that sounds so, good I know that does sound good um so I think I'm getting to them um in my heart a book of feelings by Joe Wittek it's great for smaller kids. That sounds lovely. And breathe like a bear. For smaller yeah. kids, breathe like a bear. Oh, lovely. I, I love having... It all sound calming, don't they? Um, yeah, absolutely. I love having people's recommendations because if you do Google it, there is so much out there. It's really difficult to know where to start. So if you've got some personal recommendations, that's so helpful um, to, to know that, you know, this has worked for somebody else. This morning when we were doing our, our play session about anxiety, um, somebody shared that um, their child uses a dream catcher to catch their worries. So they put their worries in the dream catcher. Maybe yeah, my, my son builds teddy cities every night because he has awful bad dreams. So his teddies start from the top of the stairs and they have laid traps for all the bad dreams to catch uh -huh. them. And then he's got a little bin by his bed. So his teddies, when they've caught them, can put the, the bad dreams in a bin. But oh my goodness, it's very convoluted. But that's how he gets to sleep at the moment. <laughs> what works, works. Exactly. <laughs> um, so somebody said um, their son can't talk. Um, but once he's calmed down, he'll draw a picture. And that's a, that's a really lovely thing. And, and, and drawing a picture is a great way of communicating. As well as just being quite a calming activity in itself. Yeah, yeah, it absolutely helps to calm, and then it's his communication as well. I think that's wonderful to be able to do that. 
Um, we've got some other recommendations here. Um, uh, the Seething Child by Russell Hoban deals with fear and trying, fear of trying. Mm. Um, so somebody's saying, and I think this is quite common at the moment, that their son needs to see them all the time and they can't leave them and even sleeping in their room. Um, mm. So that is a difficult a difficult one. Yeah, it is really hard um, because there is so much uncertainty around. I mean, maybe you could try a social story, just a really simple explanation. You know, um, that you know, I when so, uh, this is a seven year old just okay. So, yeah, yeah, having a social story, then you, you can put a bit more detail in with a seven year old as well. Um, you know, maybe maybe you need to have a series of social stories, maybe one for bedtime. Um, you know, when I'm asleep in bed, mummy's going to be asleep in her bed. Um, I, I'm going to try to sleep the night through, but this is what I can do if I wake up and I'm worried. Um, so you don't want to completely take away their comfort, but that you can um, be trying to encourage them to to be where you want them to be, so in their own bed. But I, I absolutely know your feeling. I think every other night my bed is now occupied by either an eight-year-old or an 11-year-old. Mm -hmm. um, so I think social stories and explanations for a seven-year-old, you know, that they are beginning to be able to do that reasoning and understanding. Um, I think it is, it is really hard. Maybe you can just try and extend that time, go, Mummy, even have a timer. Mummy's going to be um, out in the garden for five minutes. Here's the timer. When the timer goes off, I'm coming back in. Um, so you you do need your own space. Um, so try to just extend that time. Make sure they know. Always be reassuring that you're coming back. It's that separa separation anxiety they've got at the moment, which is really hard to deal with. No. Um, and you do want to be with them because you do want to reassure them, but at the same time, you don't want to feed into it as well, which is really tricky. Maybe if they're going to bed, they can have something of yours. Um, my daughter has got my teddy bear that I had when I was little. She takes that to bed at the moment. Um, so that's her thing of mine. Rather than coming into my bed all the time, she has my teddy in her bed. <laughs> it doesn't always work, but it does sometimes. <laughs> yes. Yes, and I think this is an exceptional kind of period of time yeah, we're going through at the moment. So, yeah. um, it, I think you just have to try different things and uh, and not be too hard on yourself or yeah, or yeah. have too high expectations of your child and just Absolutely. take little mini steps and be be yes, just be kind to yourself. Yeah. So, whoops, I've skipped a few. Um, so I don't know how to pronounce this word, Liz, but I've looked it up. <laughs> so do you have any tips and advice on how to teach children or teens with Alexi Mither? So it's a difficulty in sort of talking about their emotions. Is that right? All right, thinking that. Or maybe I'm pronouncing it so wrongly. So it's um, an inability to identify and describe emotions experienced by oneself or others. I think starting off with with some books would be a really good way of doing it. So you're removing it from them. So the focus isn't on them and their emotions. Um, so you can be teaching them going, well, in general, um, this is when, when people are sad, this is what they're going to look like. This is what they're going to do. This is what their body's going to feel like. And you can be teaching them in a very impersonal way and then slowly bring in, okay, so... I feel when I'm sad, this is how I feel. Um, and you might see me cry sometimes. Sometimes I want to be on my own. Or when I'm angry, you're going to see my face go really red. I'm probably going to shout at you. And that's how you know that I'm angry. What happens to you when you're angry? What happens to you when you're sad? And But, but starting a step back so you're not talking about themselves straight away because that can be quite confrontational sometimes, even if you're obviously not meaning it to be. Um, so I think, for, yeah, for older children, it's quite good for, for books. Some of the apps that are on the CAMS resources website are for teens, because some teams will want to go through it on their own. Um, and so if there's an app on there that you could recommend and, and you've looked at beforehand, so you're happy with, their, with the content of the app, then you could recommend your team to work through um, some, of, some of those apps. 
And again, there are some workbooks as well. There's quite a few workbooks on Amazon that, you know, if your child wants to work through it on their own, there are some good ones out there for them to work through. But I think, yeah, first of all, you're not, you're, you wanted to remove it from them. So, so, as, so it isn't so threatening for them because they're going to understand that they know it's, that they know it's very difficult for them. So talking about it more in general terms is a nice way to start. Okay, so I've got a question about an 11-year-old with selective mutism and, and autism. And when her anxiety is very high, she can't communicate. And I think that comes back to the point you were talking about, the upstairs and downstairs brain a little bit. She That's roars perfect. and hisses and uses animal noises. And I don't know how to deal with this. If I try to talk, she roars. So if I... Sh so I shut up. I find it very upsetting. Mm. So, so you could talk a little about yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. That must be really upsetting uh, and very difficult to deal with because it's going to interrupt lots of lots of activities in your life as well. Um, I think um, when a child has selective mutism, that's an anxiety-based disorder. So while speech and language therapists do work with children who have selective mutism, it is really important to be working hand in hand with some kind of psychological support because um, it, it is anxiety based. It's just that the anxiety is coming out by them not speaking in certain situations. If they have ASD on top of it, then obviously they've got a, a separate difficulty in, in trying to process their emotions. So it's really good to be able to have some support from from somebody who's psychologically trained, but who also has experience in working with ASD. You can get some, um, some um, therapists or psychologists who are trained to be able to present CBT or other um, support systems um, that are modified for children with ASD. I think one of the things you'll also find with um, that's quite common in children with selective mutism and ASD is that there's going to be some kind of level of sensory um, difficulties as well. And so it may well be that you need to be looking at some kind of sensory integration support and sensory strategies for your child. Um, because until that is worked on and they're able to, to work out what's going on with their body, it's going to be very difficult to talk to them at a more cortical level level with using their upstairs brain because they're not going to know what's going on with their downstairs brain so when we're looking at their downstairs brain we're looking at the sensory strategies and that needs to be worked at first before we can then start psychological support and the more talking therapies and the talking support with them yes. somebody that we've done some work with and who's done some training with us Aideen Brevnik who um, does sensory attachment intervention she talks very much about when a child is very upset mm. and they're in a sort of fight flight freeze response yeah. where the lower the downstairs brain is is activated you can't get on the stairs but try to imagine that you're trying to talk to the spinal cord of your child because that's what it's a bit like yeah um, they can't process what you're saying when they've got into that kind of a state so it's it's calming it down, like you've been saying, Liz. But I, I, you know, I think that's quite a helpful analogy to sometimes think, well, you know, we re we really can't reach upstairs at the moment, so let's do the other things first. Yeah, yeah, and and I think once once your child is then calmer, uh, that would be the time to to maybe um, use something like a social story. It's like I can understand that you were really anxious at, the, at that point in time and, and this is what you did when you're anxious um can we think of some other things that you can do when you're feeling anxious is i i can tell you that you're feeling anxious it's not up to you to work out but if i say to you i can see that you're feeling anxious and here's your list of strategies let's let's work our way through this list of strategies that could help you um and, and beforehand you could have gone through going okay what's what do you think is going to help? And, and that's where you might need help from a professional to have a look at different strategies that may help, you know, you, but with you and your daughter, maybe, maybe she enjoys coloring, going for a walk. Um, but it's trying to show her that away from that situation, that that response isn't an appropriate response, but you've got to, if you take away something, you've got to fill the gap with something else. So you've got to be trying to fill the gap with something that you feel is more appropriate 
for, for her to, to be reacting like. Um, but having some psychological support with selective mutism is always a good idea as well. Absolutely. So Liz, we're just about at an hour now and I think we've we've gone through the questions and thank you everybody who's um, made suggestions and asked questions because it's really helpful um, for other parents as well and and for us to learn from absolutely from you as well which is yeah we're fun. always looking for new resources that we can recommend to people <laughs> absolutely um so I think maybe in the future we might do a, a bit more of a workshop on this theme yeah. and another thing we've been talking about is doing some support for back to school when we get mm. to that point um and so we'll be putting out some information about that and we'll maybe do some kind of polls to see what people mm. really might like because there are various ways we could give some help with this. But um, we do have um, a whole lot of other live talks that we've done in the past three weeks now, um, which you can look back on the Facebook page to see. And I think that you'll find lots of other good, helpful tools, tips and strategies there, I hope, and also interesting information from that's been shared from um, people who've joined us. And if you're watching this later, thank you for joining us later. Um, so Liz, I think everybody's just saying thank you and that it's been really helpful. I don't know if there's anything you want to say as we kind of finish up now. Uh, no, I, I will add in all the different graphics and, and websites as well. Um, so you can have a look at those later too. Thank you. And uh, yes, as I said, you can visit our Facebook page. And if you want to ask for any more information, mm. then um, you can email us. And so thank you, Liz. And thank you for your cat. For <laughs> <laughs> And it's not thank you to the technology particularly. No, <laughs> no, never is, is it? The cat makes regular appearances in therapy sessions online at the moment. Bless her. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. OK. Um, as one more comment I'm just going to see that yeah thank you thank you from us and um, we'll see you again soon we're looking at next going on to the subject of sleep and we'll keep you posted about what's coming so thank you Liz and we'll see you soon take care bye-bye